everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and it's time for your weekly wrap up. And I want to begin first by thanking our newest contributor to the channel. They are Pro Select Security, and they contributed via the YouTube fan funding link. And I want to thank them for their generous contribution, as well as everyone uh, who's been continuing to contribute on an ongoing basis. I'll be updating the end credits in a couple of days uh, with all the new people we added in April. So definitely stay tuned for that. So what do we do this week? Actually, a lot of cool stuff. Uh, we got the Logitech G900 Chaos Spectrum mouse. In. This is a gaming mouse that's going to cost you, it's about $150, but you can work as a wireless mouse and as a wired mouse. A very versatile, very comfortable, I really like it actually, it's a pretty good product. Uh, and what I, I kind of messed up on the review because I said you couldn't uh, mix and match uh, keyboard commands along with mouse clicks when you're setting up macros, and I was wrong about that, and a lot of you uh, wrote in and showed me how to fix the problem, and all of you were so polite about it because a lot of times when I mess up something, I get a lot of nasty notes about what an idiot I am. Uh, the, this group was very, very nice to me to point me in the right direction so I could find the solution. I did, it worked, and I'm going to post a correction video uh, probably later tonight or tomorrow morning that uh, shows you how to do it, and I'll link back and all that good stuff. Stuff. So I want to thank everyone who wrote in so politely uh, to get me on the right track with the product because it really is a nice mouse and I, I don't, definitely want to make sure everyone understands exactly how it works. We also took a look at the Kindle Oasis. Uh, that is a new e-reader from Amazon, also a little on the pricey side. I, we're looking at a couple of expensive things over the last uh, week or two. I'm going to get back to the cheap stuff, don't worry, but uh, just the nature of when things arrive here on the channel and when they come out. Uh, sometimes, some weeks we just cover more expensive things. This is a, you know, it's another Kindle book reader from Amazon, but it's the nicest one they've ever made. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a very single purpose device. So if you're a big reader or want to get one for somebody uh, who is, this is a really good gift idea. And I think that's probably where Amazon is positioning themselves with that one. By the way, you can see all the videos I'm talking about uh, linked above. We also got my HTC Vive set up and I had a uh, epic mammoth two and a half hour uh, live stream as I struggled to get the thing working. At the uh, out, at end of it, we did get it up and running. It actually, probably about an hour of it, I'm just trying to get around a little bug that was in the installation routine. And I have someone to thank uh, for getting us out of this rut. Uh, and that was Guy Incognito. I don't know what his name is because he's incognito, but uh, he went out and found a link on Reddit that solved the problem completely for me. I had to kill a process uh, to get around the little roadblock that the HTC software kept throwing up at us. And it took about an hour to get through that. And surprisingly, uh, there was about 100 or so people watching and they all stayed with it throughout the whole thing. So what I did in this video was I uh, just took uh, this two and a half hour live stream and condensed it down to like 30 minutes or so so you can see all the key points that cover the installation and they also show some gameplay with it and I got to say uh, this thing is amazing it is really uh, a remarkable piece of technology it really works as advertised it's not perfect you'll hear that in my uh, review of it as I'm playing with it but uh, it really is a uh, probably the first time that I've seen virtual reality actually give you some sense of a virtual reality and I am I, I'm actually uh, very eager to do a lot of work this week early in the week so I can spend the, the end of the week here playing with it more because it is just a ton of fun, uh, really an amazing experience. And if you were thinking about getting one, I think definitely take a look at it because I think it's really worth a uh, consideration if you're interested in playing around in VR. I actually canceled my order for the Oculus Rift. I was talking to a lot of people. The field of vision on the Oculus isn't any better than it is on the HTC from those who've tried both. And I think it's just, you know, it's kind of foolish to get two of these kits. Uh, so I really, I, I think what they've done here with the ability to walk around in a, in a space and uh, interact interact with your hands is a really uh, compelling experience and that is why I decided to uh, stay with the Vive and uh, hold off on the Rift for now. And I also posted three interviews that I shot last weekend at PAX East, the big video game exposition in Boston. And uh, what I did is I interviewed three different developers who are coming at the industry from different perspectives. We talked to an indie developer who's starting from scratch with uh, some really cool point and click games. We talked to a triple A game developer who is getting their game published by Sega and you know, really approaching a very wide and mass audience with a huge development team. Uh, and I talked to Ron Gilbert who uh, developed a lot of games that I used to play as a kid. He was an independent developer in the 80s and uh, got into the uh, gaming industry right when it got started and he worked for LucasArts. He developed their adventure game system uh, that they used as an engine for all of their other games and now he's come full circle and is going independent with his new game Thimbleweed Park that he just funded on Kickstarter. So kind of a neat perspective just to see how uh, different ways of developing games there are out there these days and I'm really disappointed I didn't get a lot of viewership on these. I was shocked actually uh, how low the viewership was. My interviews don't always do as well as my reviews do but these did 
really poorly is so insofar as views are concerned. So I know a lot of people subscribe to the channel to see new and exciting gadgets, but uh, the interviews I really love doing. So even if nobody watches them, I just enjoy talking to people and learning about uh, how their business works and how, uh, in this case, game development works in the 21st century. And uh, it's really interesting stuff. So if you have a few minutes, uh, check it out. I am going to compile all of this uh, footage and put it into audio form and put it up on my podcast feed. So if you want to listen to it in the car or something, you can do that. But I'd love to hear from you all about what kinds of interviews you'd like for me to do in the future because I really, like I said, I really do enjoy uh, doing these things and I, I spend a lot of effort and lugging equipment around to do them, but I really want to get your feedback as to the kind of interviews that uh, you all might think you'd like to watch. So definitely let me know in the comments below and I will take that under consideration. The new studio is coming along. We shot our first video down there, which was the HTC Vive setup. And uh, what I'll be doing over the next couple of days is starting to move myself down there. I'm trying to move in a very organized fashion and I want to get, um, you know, I really want to get caught up on a lot of the reviews that I'm doing in here because I know this set piece is working. Everything looks nice and uh, I'm going to have to take some time to experiment to get the right look for downstairs at least to get started. So I'm going to start with the uh, minimal viable product, but I had that already up here. So I want to get caught up and then uh, move the studio recording stuff down last after I get my other workspace set up. So probably uh, I'm thinking maybe this weekend, uh, provided I am not um, uh, del helping deliver my, my next daughter who's due any day now. So uh, if she comes early, I will get it done this weekend. And if she's later, we'll probably wait until after she's born before I really uh, disrupt another portion of the lifestyle uh, here. But we're getting there uh, and we'll be doing a little bit more down there each day. In fact, one of the reviews that I have uh, shot already uh, will be uh, using that space too. So you'll see more of it uh, in the coming days. Kind of a, a very a, a slow transition over from here to down there, but it'll, you'll know it when you see it. Uh, so now it's time for some q and a, and let's see what we got this week. So uh, Link Designs wrote in about Intel, and they are now canceling their future Atom processors. And this is big news for this channel because uh, a big part of what I do is review ultra cheap PCs, and now there's not going to be as many. So uh, we might have to start looking for other stuff to do, at least PCs that can run Windows. I'm sure there's going to be other things happening. But uh, basically what's happened here is Intel intended those Atom processors really to be used in mobile phones. Now, of course, they uh, were also marketing them to PC and tablet manufacturers, but uh, they have lost a ton of ground to the ARM chipset, which uh, really is dominating mobile and is dominating set-top boxes and is dominating just about everything but PCs. And Intel was hoping that they could uh, come in and uh, take some of that market share back, but that effort appears to have failed and they've lost a lot of money in the process. And Part of why these PCs like the Kangaroo and some of this uh, junk we get from China, uh, why they were so cheap was that Intel was, was almost subsidizing the, the cost of these chips to just get them out there into the marketplace. And they are remarkably uh, well equipped and they can do a lot of amazing things like run Windows and other you know, major, major uh, desktop operating systems, but uh, they could not afford to keep making this bet and not seeing any return on it. And that is why they did what they did. So um, Link Designs here is wondering what I think about it. And I think what it means is that uh, we're going to see the end of these $99 Windows PCs at some point. I think we'll see a little bit uh, longer of a stretch here because they do have processors that are developed and, and manufactured and will be out in the uh, into the product cycle for a little bit. I think the Cherry Trail chips will continue to be uh, manufactured for a little bit longer. So I think the Kangaroo is safe and at least in its current iteration for now. But uh, the next generation of these machines, I think if you're looking at a $50 or a $99 computer, it is going to be running an ARM processor. It'll probably be running Chrome OS or maybe Remix OS or uh, some other kind of uh, mobile operating system that's designed perhaps for a desktop environment. So we're seeing Android, of course, have a TV interface now uh, with that rumor that we covered last week about Chrome OS and Android merging uh, their, their uh, app stores together to bring Android apps officially to Chrome. I think we're going to see a lot more of that desktopification of mobile operating systems. And you won't be running uh, Windows on these cheap devices, or at least the Windows that we're familiar with on our regular computers, but uh, likely some ARM-based variant that will likely come from Google because that OS is free. And you know it really didn't serve Microsoft all that well either because they weren't really gaining a lot of revenue from uh, the Windows licenses they were selling on these computers too. So it's it's going to be the end of it. I, it's kind of this. It's kind of sad actually because I I really like the fact that you could really get 
a full-blown PC for such a low price. But I think we're still going to see the $200 laptops. I think we'll still see like the $250 or $300 desktops. And the likelihood is that when you spend $300 on a desktop, it's actually going to perform a lot better than it might on a $150 desktop. So we'll see, you know, perhaps a Skylake Celeron uh, desktop or the equivalent desktop processor versus a, a mobile chip that might feel underpowered under load. So, yeah, we'll see where it goes. But I think uh, the, the days of the $99 Windows PC were short lived and it's disappointing, but uh, you can always buy one used for that price. So we'll see where uh, things go in the future. There's a great article, by the way, up on, on, on a non-tech that covers uh, the entire decision here that Intel made along with some statements from Intel. Uh, definitely a good read if you are into Intel uh, product roadmaps and we'll see where that goes. And uh, we'll just keep an eye on it moving forward, but uh, I'm kind of sad, but we'll see. We'll see what comes up after this. There's a lot of opportunity now for other uh, PC makers to get into the space that Intel is vacating here because there is a market for cheap stuff. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, Niles uh, Bjorklund is wondering about uh, video podcasts. So I mentioned in the last uh, minute ago about the audio podcast feed of those videos that I did. And video podcasts are really expensive to do because you have to get a lot of storage online that you can allow people to access publicly and you have to transfer all that bandwidth to them. So just to give you an idea, uh, every video that I post is usually about a gigabyte in size. So that's a lot of storage that I have to buy on a web hosting provider. I don't think people realize, you know, when we complain about YouTube, and I'm, I'm certainly guilty of this too, uh, complain about YouTube treating us poorly and all this other stuff. Uh, the fact is that it costs a lot of money to uh, do what it takes for you to see this video. And uh, how YouTube does it at the scale they do is mind boggling and still be able to afford to pay me and everyone else that does content is just, it's just incredible. And uh, to do this yourself is uh, prohibitively expensive, at least for the size of the channel that I have here. It's really a lot of storage, a lot of bandwidth to get those video files to people. And uh, people don't really have a good client for watching uh, video podcasts either. I think people really do like going to platforms like YouTube and Netflix and Hulu and uh, you know, and other things that are popping up like Vessel uh, versus actually going and having to seek out a podcast feed and download everything. So that's why I haven't done a video podcast. I have experimented with it in the past on some other projects that I've done, but uh, it's really hard to get an audience and it's a lot of effort and a lot of money uh, to set it up. But maybe one day when I get kicked off all the major platforms and uh, I'm thrown off the internet, maybe I'll look at uh, doing some other things there. And a lot of you have been writing in about my discussion on Comcast and Roku last week. In fact, we're still having a debate in the comment thread from uh, last week's video. Quick recap is that Roku and Comcast are teaming up and Roku will have in the fall an app that will allow their devices to work like a Comcast cable box. And uh, Comcast did this rather quickly, in my opinion, to go back to the FCC to say, hey, look, see, we're allowing uh, customers to use their own equipment on our network now, so leave us alone with your proposed regulation. Now, uh, the FCC has been uh, looking at developing regulatory controls to force cable providers to allow customers to bring their own equipment and not have to rent it from the cable company. And uh, some of you wrote in saying, hey, let the market forces kind of work themselves out here. Don't try to impose more regulation on them because it's just going to make things worse. Uh, other folks like me, I have a different feeling about this because where I live, I have no choice. Comcast is the only thing I can use uh, for television and for internet. And a great example of what happens with monopolies with no competition is what happened right here in my house that led to the video that started this channel, which was, I think I said this last week too, but it's worth mentioning again, uh, that TV behind me, I used to be able to plug a cable into it turn it on and get most of the channels that I was paying for without having to rent a box from the cable company. I didn't get everything, but I got everything that I wanted, uh, which was what I was paying for without having to buy or rent or, or do anything uh, from the cable company beyond paying my subscription fee. One day I woke up, turned on the television and everything was encrypted. I couldn't watch anything. Even like the, uh, I think like the basic analog stations worked uh, temporarily until they switched everything over to digital. When I wrote to Comcast on Twitter, they had the nerve to tell me that uh, this was a requirement of the the FCC. They actually said that, that they had to do it. Uh, the only I shot back, of course, the answer was the FCC allowed them to do it, but didn't require them to do it. Uh, so my choice at that point was to go out and rent equipment for more money to watch the channels I was already paying for, uh, or do what I did, which was get a cable card and an HD home run set up and go through this elaborate project of uh, you know, building my own little cable system in the house. And it's been working great for a couple of years now, but uh, the fact is this is a really piss poor thing to do to a consumer because uh, there is no choice where I am and there's no regulation anymore either. And what happened in my area was that uh, when our telephone company started to build out cable television services, Comcast ran to the state legislature and got them to remove all of the regulatory or most of the regulatory controls they were under uh, that were actually pretty uh, good at keeping them honest with consumers over the years. 
years. In fact, I was on my local advisory council that would meet with Comcast on, a, I think, a monthly or bi-monthly basis to make sure that they were uh, fulfilling their obligations to the community. And then every uh, decade or so, they actually had to go and reapply for their franchise in order to be able to operate in the state because they had a monopoly on wireline cable television. Now, when the phone company came in, uh, they started building out their network, but they never finished. So Comcast, just as soon as that first wire hit the ground, uh, they went out and got their regulations removed. But I still have not yet seen the phone company bring cable television over to uh, where I live. And I think it's been about 10 years or, or so uh, since they started their build out, which has pretty much stopped since uh, maybe five or six years ago. So uh, bottom line is that they can do whatever they want to me. And if they can make it uh, make that happen with the television shows that I'm watching, uh, they can do something to my internet feed here to make it impossible for me to do business. And that's my biggest fear is that, uh, you know, my business, this YouTube channel relies upon my ability to be able to get an adequate connection to upload videos and do my live streams and do everything that I do. Uh, and if Comcast tomorrow decides they want to charge me $1,500 a month to do what I'm doing now, they could do that. There's just simply no uh, protection that I have and I have no competitor that I can run to uh, to do that. And, I, and just as a business person, it's very scary to uh, have your business depend on one choice. And that is what I was trying to get at here. And this uh, really is that because what's happening here is Comcast is going to decide uh, which boxes out there can use their service versus ones that can't. Meanwhile, every television in existence that's been made in the last five or six years uh, can, can tune these channels if the cable company just decrypted them. They're not under any requirement to uh, encrypt the channels that they're encrypting. Some have to because of HBO's stuff or whatever, but uh, a lot of uh, other channels, especially networks and everything else that are coming over free over the air anyhow, which I can't get here by the way either, uh, could just be provided over the wire and they made the decision to uh, lock customers into these rental boxes and that is where I'm standing on this. I think, you know, in areas where they have true competition, I certainly agree that, that having additional regulatory controls doesn't help the market but in my instance, uh, there is no competition. There probably will never be competition and uh, me as a consumer uh, does not have the same kind of power that a consumer has in a more competitive environment. And I want to show you two articles here real quick that kind of make the point. Uh, so this one from The Verge that came out probably a day or two after I was ranting about the uh, data caps last week. It uh, looks like Comcast is going to raise their data caps in areas that they're uh, enforcing data caps from 300 gigabytes a month to one terabyte, which is a huge increase and a very good thing. I'm going to give them credit for that. I don't think there should be caps at all based on what people are paying, but let that be what it is. Uh, they are making it easier for some of their competitors now to operate like Netflix because uh, you're not going to kill your, uh, your, your uh, data cap within two weeks of uh, your kid getting a hold of their Netflix app. So that's a good thing. But that came because the FCC started getting a lot of consumer complaints and was considering additional regulatory controls, or at least trying to enforce additional regulatory controls on Comcast to prevent that from happening. And by the way, all this regulatory stuff came about because Comcast and other big internet providers who are running regional monopolies wanted to uh, change the, the game, the way the game is played and favor certain services over the wire versus others and eliminate my ability to perhaps get my YouTube channel to you as easily as I could if I was on Google Fiber versus uh, Comcast because they could maybe favor uh, the traffic coming from Comcast's own properties. So this is why regulation sometimes with monopolies has some uh, good effects. So that was something interesting. Now I want to show you uh, something else that's good that came as a result of competition and that Comcast is beginning to roll out gigabit service uh, in areas that Google is either in or considering entering in with their Google Fiber service. And this is a very good thing because in those areas where consumers have choice, they're now getting uh, multiple gigabit choices in their places of residence or business. So we saw this with AT&T when they were getting pushed by Google Fiber a bit who said they would never be able to do gigabit and suddenly they turned the uh, switch on uh, and off they went. So this is what we're up against right now. We do need choices. And uh, if we had choices, we wouldn't need to threaten regulatory action. But really the only way to get Comcast right now to do better things for consumers is either threaten them with regulation or put a competitor in place. And where I live, it's just maybe not all that feasible for a competitor to come. It's very expensive to wire up Connecticut, uh, certainly because there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of mileage in between customers versus a city where there's a lot more customers per mile. So we'll see what happens here. But I think a balance of uh, regulatory control where it's necessary uh, and competition where you can have it uh, will mean better things for consumers. But that's my take. Let's debate some more down below in the comment stream. Happy to keep this going. I really do enjoy talking to all of you about that. 
And now it's time for some Q&A for you. And I've kind of already asked this question when I was talking about those three interviews at the beginning of the video, but I'm very curious, just uh, for those of you who did not click on the, these interviews, because many of you did not, uh, what turns you off from watching those, those things? Was it the content area? You know, because I was covering gaming content, which is not something I typically uh, cover here on the channel, if, especially if it's not hardware. I'm just curious really what uh, would get you more interested in some of these interviews, because I really do, like I said, really do enjoy doing them. And I'd love to uh, get some more feedback from you as to what you want to see. So that is your Q&A for the week. So leave those down uh, in the comments below. So this week, we got some stuff that I think you'll find of interest. Uh, this came in, in fact, I already shot this review. This is called the Viewfine, and this is a wearable HDMI monitor that you can put on glasses so you can see like your GoPro camera or something else. Kind of a neat product. It's not a Google Glass replacement. This is strictly a monitor, and you've got to plug a cable into it uh, in order to get it to work. So your camera has to be close to where your Viewfine is for it to operate, uh, but you'll see how it works. And I even was able to get a uh, picture of its little screen going with my iPhone. So you'll be able to see what it looks like too, which is pretty cool inside of the device there. I also got one of these. This is cool. This is a cell phone bo booster called the EQO, and it works with every uh, major carrier here in the United States. And this actually works. I've seen so many of these boosters be like snake oil. This one I found uh, really does do the trick. I was really surprised actually it worked and he didn't have to, I didn't have to do anything to set it up beyond plugging it in and uh, hooking up a cable to something. So it's one of these uh, amplifier repeater deals. So there's nothing you have to do with the internet or anything else. You just plug it in, point some stuff at it, and boom, you're done. And I was really impressed with this. So you'll be seeing that uh, later this week as well. And I know a lot of you have been waiting for this, and this just came in. Uh, this is the X1 tablet from Lenovo. This is their, uh, their answer to the Microsoft Surface. So we'll see what this looks like. I'm going to probably get to that uh, as soon as I can, which means maybe tomorrow or the next day. So stay tuned as soon as I get it all tested and uh, played with, we'll take it from there. I did uh, open up the box a little earlier. It is a ThinkPad, but it feels like uh, a Surface, uh, you know, Surface kind of uh, experience to it. So you've got that ThinkPad feel, but a Surface-like design. So pretty cool, and we will be looking at that more uh, later in the week. So if you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash Patreon and make a monthly contribution to the channel. And of course, we got that fan funding link here at the uh, front of the page. And again, my plan with this is to uh, hire somebody very, very shortly, as soon as I move everything downstairs uh, to help me get things prepped for the show. And a great example would be getting that X1 set up for uh, reviewing. So having him uh, kind of run some of the benchmarks and get all my software installed on it. That's the kind of thing that this kid's going to do. He's going to start very shortly. I have to meet my own regulatory requirements by getting workers' comp insurance and everything else set up. So I'm almost ready to start that process. And uh, hopefully by the summer, we'll have uh, this uh, young person downstairs helping out with everything we need to do to do more content for you. So that is where those funds are going towards. And we have my Amazon link at lon.tv tv slash Amazon. Everything you do after going through that link on Amazon comes back to the channel. So we get a small portion of your Amazon purchases, and it's actually becoming a very big part of the channel revenue. So that really helps us, and it's a passive thing for you because your price doesn't change. U.S. only at the moment. I do need to investigate how to get myself set up for uh, other countries' Amazon stores, but right now it's U.S. only, and I do appreciate everyone who uh, was interested in participating in other countries. I am working on figuring it out, uh, so stay tuned. Uh, we got my email address uh, or email list at lon.tv slash email. I have not sent out an email in ages. I will do that soon. lon.tv slash Facebook for the Facebook page. I'm starting to do like little random live streams on there, so definitely uh, subscribe, and you might see me every once in a while pop up on there. The forums, which are pretty much dead at this point, at lon.tv slash forums, and our growing Reddit channel at lon.tv slash Reddit. So that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap-up. Let's keep that Comcast discussion going. Uh, we can maybe talk some free market versus regulatory stuff, too. I love getting into some policy weeds with you all, and I'm always learning, even when I'm, even if I think I'm right, sometimes I'm not. So definitely uh, fight me a little bit down there. Let me uh, explore some other points of view on this topic. This is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters, including Gold Level supporter Shabib. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.